So you're wondering, Pastor, why are we doing 2 Thessalonians? And well, the practical answer is because we just finished 1 Thessalonians. <laughs> no, seriously, it is good for us to go through books of the Bible. We learn a lot because God gets to set the agenda and we are forced to follow him. He sets our trajectory and he forces us to think like he does. My old voice teacher, William Miller, who I first took voice lessons with when he was 89 and last when he was almost 91, he stopped performing professionally at the age of 88. He was a lyric tenor, used to perform on the old radio station in Chicago back in the 50s, um, and actually 40s as well, uh, at the Met out in New York. And uh, you've heard me tell this, so I'll just be quick. He was kind of like Yoda, little but mighty. And he always used to say to me as a young student, you're not speaking my language. I'd ask him some question out of left field, uh, and he'd say, you're not speaking my language. He would force me to reorient my thinking along his lines. And when we go through books of the Bible, that's what God does. He forces us, no, no, Kevin, let's, let's be thinking how I'm thinking. And it's a good discipline for us to get in the habit of. Well, 2 Thessalonians, as you can see, I think the theme, and this may be overgeneralized, I may have missed some things, but in my fallen nature, I think the word steadfast captures the book as a whole. So if you want one word to take away for this book, 2 Thessalonians, Paul's second letter, is steadfast. 2 Thessalonians, Thessalonians, easy for me to say, this could be a long series, <laughs> will help us who are in Christ remain steadfast in our faith and our love for one another and in our works for the Lord. Why or how? Because it is Jesus who is risen from the dead. He is forever loving and steadfast. He is our hope and will keep us steadfast to him. <clears throat> this morning, we're going to focus on the first four verses of the letter. But we're going to go backwards first. We're going to take a peek <clears throat> at how Paul and his missionaries got to Thessalonica. Two, we're going to then look at his first letter to the church. Three, we're going to walk through some of the major themes of what we can expect these next weeks. And then we'll unpack the first four verses. Again, we're going to go back to Acts 16, 17. How do we get here? Review a little bit of 1 Thessalonians from our last series. Then what are the major themes in our letter uh, that we're going to be studying now and then unpacking the first four verses. Would you stand with me as we read the first four verses of 2 Thessalonians? This is on page 683 in your paper pew Bible. Again, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, <clears throat> verses 1 through 4. Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy to the church of the Thessalonians in God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We ought always to give thanks to God for you, brothers, as is right, because your faith is growing abundantly and the love of every one of you for one another is increasing. Therefore, we ourselves boast about you and the churches of God for your steadfastness and faith in all your persecutions and in the afflictions that you are enduring. And God bless the reading of his word. Let's pray. Lord, we stand <clears throat> like the church way back in Thessalonica under Roman rule stood to hear your word. We, <laughs> we stand with them. And the angels are listening as well to your word read, not only here, but in churches all over the globe, in thousands of tongues, wearing different dresses and outfits, singing and dancing to different songs, but nonetheless worshiping you. It is good to be reminded that we are not alone and that there is a much bigger worshiping body of Christ outside of these walls. Thank you for your word. Holy Spirit, we ask, as you were sent to do, that you would do the work of conviction in our hearts. Please open up our ears. Please open up our eyes and soften our hard hearts so that we might today afresh repent and believe by faith in all that you have done and promised through your Son, our Lord. And, it's in, and in his name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. So going backward to go forward. You remember Paul received a vision he received a vision 
that there was a man in Macedonian garb, that's how Paul knew who he was, the distinctive hat that marked Alexander the Great's empire when they marched through a lot of Asia, at that time the biggest conquest of the world. And that man said, come over to Macedonia and help us. This is in Acts chapter 16. So Paul and Silas and Timothy and Luke, who was with him at that time, felt very firmly that God had called them to preach the gospel. So they crossed the boundary, the water boundary there, the ocean, and came over to what we would call modern-day Greece. They ended up in the city of Philippi, if you remember. This is the city named after Philip II, Alexander the Great's father. And the two of them got chucked in jail. And you remember the miracle of how God opened up the, 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 the prison with the earthquake and the jailer and his family were converted and baptized that day. Amazing but exhausting. Paul and Barnabas and Silas then continue along that incredible Roman road right into what is today modern-day Thessaloniki, then Thessalonica. 100,000 people at that time. Huge for that day and age. Now a million. Second largest city in Greece to Athens, the capital. <clears throat> and they begin to witness to them three weeks in the synagogues, we learn, and in verse 4, <clears throat> some were persuaded, chapter 6, 17, Acts, verse 4, some were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas. So some were converted after three weeks of preaching every Saturday in the synagogue, and some were converted, not a few uh, noted here by Paul, wealthy or established women, women of some substance here in the community. But things went bad as they typically do. The gospel hits town and the devil riles up some jealous Jews and they get a mob. And next thing you know, Jason, their host, is hauled off for fear of beatings and imprisonment, but gets out paying a fine. But they, the Thessalonians, these young group of believers, clearly believe Paul and Silas and Timothy are in danger, so they send them out that night, and they go to Berea. So Paul's first letter comes after having sent Timothy to visit this young church. And you remember some of the themes we went through as Paul, like a, like a pastor, an elder, like a father, is concerned for the health of these brothers and sisters, these children in the faith. This is probably, 1 Thessalonians, that is, probably the second letter Paul ever wrote, second to Galatians, by the way. So these were a changed people, as we found out last series. The gospel had changed their life, changed everything, changed their affections, even when they were suffering in affliction, changed their living from sexual immoral behaviors to holy sexual behaviors. God was calling them to love one another as brothers and sisters. He was calling them to root their present hope in the future glory and the coming of Christ. And that our ultimate fate, their ultimate fate, is tied to God's faithfulness and not their fickle, wandering faith. It was a good word for us in 1 Thessalonians, which we titled that series, The Gospel Changes Everything in a Man or Woman or Child's Life. Now let's do some sneak peek themes, theme peeking here at the second letter to the Thessalonians. Paul and company, if you have your Bible open, you notice, and you just read with me a typical greeting who wrote it, who's it written to, and a blessing. And then Paul <clears throat> begins to, in verses 5 through 7, talk about how the Thessalonians' suffering can be considered as evidence that they're worthy of God's kingdom. Now, we'll unpack this next week, but that is foreign to our thoughts as American Christians, that your suffering can be proof of your worthiness to inherit the kingdom of God. Then moving on to verses 11 and 12, still in chapter 1, Paul corrects some false teaching on the second coming of Christ and instead reminds us and reminds the Thessalonians that it's a very real comfort for you and I to know that Jesus is coming back. And he unpacks some of that teaching, talking about the man of lawlessness in chapter 2 and the day of the Lord, which we will study in a few chapters. And then... Let's pause on chapter 2, verses 13 through 15. We find our theme repeated here, steadfast. Reading in verse 15. So then, brothers, and by the way, whenever you read brothers, read sisters too. That's the intention of the language. It's inferred. So then, brothers and sisters, stand firm or be steadfast. 
and hold to the traditions that you were taught by us, either by our spoken word or by our letter. So Paul realizes that with any gathering of believers, the church as we call it, there's a temptation to slide or lose our footing in the word. The good news is that our steadfastness is actually rooted not in our effort, although that is part of it, but it is first and foremost rooted in God's steadfastness. Verse 5, chapter 3. May the Lord direct your hearts to the love of God and to the steadfastness of Christ. Again, steadfast refers in this book to both our steadfast, but how it is always rooted on the foundation that God is steadfast. He endures. He never changes. <clears throat> Moving on in chapter 3, Paul addresses rather bluntly some idlers, some people who are just busybodies. They're not working. Now, there's been some thought over the centuries that this was because they were stopped working. They were just waiting for Jesus to return. I don't think that's the case here. Actually, what I think is going on is a cultural phenomenon of the benefactor, benefactee, whatever the right language is there. You have quite a bit of wealth in this city, and a lot of wealthy Romans, uh, as the Macedonians were shipped out after the Romans conquered them, they brought a lot of wealthy Roman uh, people in, and it's really common in a Roman culture. When you've got some money and some prestige, it's good on you to help those who don't have much. And you provide for them their meals, their sustenance, their living, and in return, they help you in politics, they help you in praising you in public, etc. So there's this Roman-Greek relationship that Paul is seeing as super unhealthy in the church. There's men and women not working. Maybe have never worked a day in their life. And it's, it's not because they can't, it's because there's this, there's this relationship, there's this benefactor thing going on. And so Paul speaks pretty boldly here in verses 11 and following in chapter 3. For we hear that some among you walk in idleness, not busy at work, but busy bodies. You don't really do anything, you just talk. Now, such persons we command and encourage in the Lord Jesus Christ to do their work quietly and to earn their own living. Verse 13, as for you, brothers, do not grow weary in doing good. So get to work. Now, we, don't, we can't conflate this with some of our cultural struggles. Uh, this is a, a different, this is apples and oranges with, with welfare, etc. But there is some underlying principle here that God has given us the gift of work. And while there are thistles and thorns, it's still part of who we are. We're meant to work. So Paul addresses this culture in the church for the second time. He did earlier in 1 Thessalonians, though we covered it briefly. And that's how Paul closes the letter, <clears throat> is with this kind of abrupt but, but strong, hey, get to work and don't stop doing good works as well. <clears throat> now let's turn back to chapter 1. And let's unpack the first four verses of our passage today. You'll see thankfulness here that we're going to unpack in verses three through four. And why? Why thankfulness? Why does that perhaps summarize our verses three and four here? Because every one of us, every man, woman, and child, every Thessalonian who is in Christ, every man, woman here at Thief River Falls Evangelical Free Church in Christ, who are called to remain steadfast for him, are first Thankful that we're trophies of God's grace. And that is the title for today's sermon, Trophies of God's Grace. So our letter opens up, Paul, Silvanus, Timothy, nothing new there. Silvanus is the Latin name of Silas. So if you see Silas in other passages in Acts, same dude. To the church of the Thessalonians, in God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now normally we skip this, we see this all the time in the letters. But I want to point out a little preposition that means a lot. And that is in to the church of the Thessalonians, it doesn't say who believe in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. It says who are in. So here we have the doctrine of, the, of our union with Christ or our adoption into the family of God. It's something we assume and take for granted. Let's just pause there and remember. Let's remember that you and I, friends, are in Christ if we believe in him. We are in God the Father. We are now in the family of God. Paul, an apostle, is writing to you as a fellow brother or sister in Christ. 
It's amazing. It's unbelievable. Your family now transcends your biological strings. If those were hard, if you don't even know your, your biological mother or father, the good news is you're now in the, fa- the family of God. If you're in Christ, you know who your heavenly father is. And you have fellow brothers and sisters who, yeah, we look different than each other, that's okay. But we still have the same blood that is Christ's blood that covers us and brings a bond of unity that is unlike anything else in this world if we are loving one another. So don't read past those words when you begin a letter in the New Testament. Remember, to the church of the Thessalonians in, in union with, adopted by God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And then next, notice, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I believe I'm correct in observing by another uh, scholar's observation that it's always grace first and then peace. So if that's always the case in the letters, there must be a reason. Let's, let's think about it. Why would that be? Why must grace precede peace? Well, without God's grace, none of us would have been born and none of us would have been reborn. Fair enough, in a very simple manner. Without God's grace, we would have no hope. What is grace again? Let's just make sure we're defining our terms. Grace isn't the effortless moves of a ballerina or the way a left or right winger can put the puck in the net. Grace is simply defined God's unmerited favor. So it comes from God, doesn't originate in us. Two, it's unmerited. That's a big word for unearned. Didn't, we didn't do anything good to get that grace, to get that gift and, and favor. That is, God looks at you and I with loving kindness and not just the wrath that some of us grew up fearing. That is there. God's wrath is just and it will come as we remembered in 1 Thessalonians. But first and foremost, friends, if you're in Christ, you have received incredible grace. Johnny Erickson Tata, I, I, I admire her a lot. and Many of you know of her. She is a, a quadriplegic. I believe that is the correct term from a diving accident. Struggled a great deal with depression early on when her body, as she was a teenager, I believe, when she was injured. But she really gets grace. I mean, from you and I, from, a, from an American standpoint where we overvalue youth and looks to the point where most images you and I see on the TV aren't even real. They're, they're computer graphically enhanced. Here she is, a woman bound in a wheelchair who can't feed herself, at least as far as I remember. Maybe she can, but barely. And she just sees God's grace and goodness and kindness in ways that you and I could grow so much so much. So God's grace, his unmerited favor, that the creator of the universe would show love to a people born in rebellion and choosing to rebel constantly. We are, by nature, self-centered. So that God would, would break in and want to choose you. It's just unbelievable. He would choose me. We, we didn't deserve any of it. So grace has to, has to go forced or has to go before peace. Has to go before peace. We're not people of peace. We may want peace. We may work for it, but it doesn't come easy, does it? And it doesn't come often. It doesn't come easy. It doesn't come often. There's so much that can upset our apple cart <clears throat> that's outside of our control. And then there's the way that we, we sabotage ourselves, isn't there? Moms, dads, adults, kids. I mean, we just we let the worries get us, the anxieties. We start doing things we know we shouldn't be doing because we think that's going to solve my problem, bring me peace, and it doesn't. And I feel guilty and I feel worse because I know it was wrong. And, and then rinse, repeat, cycle, recycle. Peace is not something we can, get, we can have on our own. We need a Savior to have peace. We need God's grace in our lives to have peace. So when Paul gives this blessing, he means it. Grace to you. May you receive and believe and feel God's grace, Christian, unbeliever, man or woman outside of Christ. May you receive that grace today, Paul prays. And then you will know 
peace. And believe her, maybe that peace has been fleeting because you know you're, you're doing stuff you shouldn't be doing. You're looking for peace in all the wrong places. Then repent afresh today. Say, God, I'm sorry. I know I'm seeking other idols and not you. Grace and peace, Paul says, from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Already we have so much to be thankful for. Now let's unpack why Paul and Silvanus and Timothy are, are thankful. He says, in strong language, we ought always to give thanks to God for you, brothers, as is right. We ought always. That's a really big should. We should always. It is our good duty to be thankful to God for everything. But Paul qualifies a specific reason here. And what is it? Because of the Thessalonians' faith and love. And both are increasing. It's my assumption that, in, like most things in life, we're either increasing in them or declining. That there really is no such thing as a plateau except for a geological structure. So we're either growing in grace and love and peace and, uh, and you know, faith and, and insert, uh, healthiness, diet, etc., or we're declining. There really is no true coast in life. I imagine it in a different way. When Paul talks about faith growing, it's the roots of the tree. And roots grow, don't they? They continue to grow until the tree dies. So our faith is intended to grow deep, deep, deep roots. Not shallow, like the parable of the four soils where we would wilt when there's hard times and our faith would fade, etc. But deep roots that can weather a drought, that can weather the storms we've had the past couple days, the storms we have in our lives. Yes, things are hard, and if anybody promised you that Christianity is an easy life, I'm sorry they lied to you. That's not true. There's no guarantee. In fact, the New Testament seems to say it's supposed to be harder. Nevertheless, deep roots of faith grow. And you know what happens when, when trees or bushes or shrubs get deep roots? Well, then the branches can really flourish and grow. Now think of that as love. That love is those branches able to reach out and then they bear fruit. And that fruit is the way that we show our love to one another. And even more miraculous is the way that we show that love to people who don't love us in return. That's a real sign of God's work in our lives. So Paul is giving thanks to God because this church that he planted some years ago, we're not really sure how, how much of a time has passed. This church is growing. They're not declining. They're growing in faith. Deep, abundant growth in faith in who God is and what he has done for them. And boy, that affects their heart. They're showing love toward one another. One another. One another. You have to have that, right? <clears throat> and it's increasing. It's growing. Paul is thankful no surprise, because of course God is the first mover in all of this. He's the author of this. Without God, there would be no growth in faith. There would be no growth in love. How do our roots grow, friends? Let's just remind ourselves of what we know to be true. Our roots grow in faith in God's word. As we drink deeply or to use uh, Ortland's analogy from deeper, as we breathe in God's word each day, then we breathe out prayer. It's that cycle. Breathing in God's word, whether we wake or in the middle of the day or as we close at night, and then we can breathe out God's word in prayer. Remember that, that illustration, my old teacher, Mr. Miller, you're not speaking my language. As we breathe in God's word, it reorients our self-centered view of life and the world and what really matters and then that properly orients our prayers to the Lord. We start praying not just for our own needs, but for the needs of others. We start just with giving God thanks for who he is. We remember to confess our sins, the ones that nobody else sees, but the covetousness, the covetousness in our heart, the hatred, the jealousy, the things that eat away at our roots, the, that, that begin to destroy our fruit. 
The breathing in of God's word and the breathing out of prayer is what gives the Thessalonians deep faith, deep roots in you and I as well. We're thankful and it's our right and our good privilege to give thanks to God in all things, friends, because it is he that makes us grow and it is he that keeps us steadfast in action by faith. Read with me in verse four. Therefore, we ourselves boast about you in the churches of God for your steadfastness and faith in all your persecutions and in the afflictions that you are enduring. Let me read that again. Therefore, we ourselves, this is Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy, we boast about you in all the other churches of God for your steadfastness and faith in all your persecutions and in the afflictions that you are enduring. There's our theme again, steadfast. It's interesting that Paul can boast. Now, boasting in ourselves is forbidden in the scriptures. Proverbs and elsewhere say, don't boast in yourself, but boast in the Lord. That's what Paul's doing here. He's boasting of this church because he knows God gets all the glory for the fruit that's on display, for the faith that is growing, for the love that is branching out. So it's good that he's boasting on this church And he's using that church as an example. And remember in 1 Thessalonians how often Paul said, imitate us as we imitate Christ. Here he's just saying, look at this church. They love each other. Their faith is growing. Imitate that. See that. That's a good model. We do this in the workplace. If we aspire to that next position, we find a model that we think, yeah, he or she, she does it right. And we model ourselves. We we want to understand how they do it and do it so well. So here too, Paul holds up the Thessalonians again as a model for all other churches. And it's a model for us, friends. Can you and I say that we are growing in faith as a church, holistically here, not just individually, but holistically in our faith and in our love for one another? It's a good question to ask. Can I tell you that the elders and I, we've been boasting on you in our meetings. We think you are growing. We think we see more and more fruit of love for one another that maybe five years ago wasn't quite there. We see it as you linger in the commons and just talk and catch up. We, we see it in the way that you care for one another when someone's hurting or has a need. The way you love one another and support one another. I think, friends, you should be commended. And God, of course, gets the glory because you're growing in love for one another. So here's the encouragement. Keep it up. Get better at it. Find more grace and find more power by the Spirit to love one another even more. And let that spill out as it's been doing these past several years into the community. We talk about our caring fund a lot, and we were talking about this at the Finance Commission, another way that we are bragging about you, by the way, boasting about you, And you respond, you give to that caring fund. And we get to, when needs come in and they say, hey, the free church, they've helped me. Maybe they could help you. We get a chance to use those extra funds towards helping others. So keep it up. Don't stop. Fan that flame even more. And know that it's based on our love for the word. And here's another way that we commend you. You have shown time and time again for 121 years, you value God's word and you study it on Sundays and on Wednesdays and at your homes and in small groups, continue. And if, brothers or sisters, you're not plugged into a group outside of Sunday, well, there's a next step for you. Take that next step to grow in God's word with other men or women or youth group or Awana. Continue, grow, and watch God's grace fan and fuel those desires. In closing, we have much to be thankful for, don't we? We have much to be thankful for. If you've been struggling with bitterness, woe is me, the hardship of even just the floods these past two days, let me encourage you to go back and see God's grace in the past that is your salvation and thank him for it and then ask him to help you see what he's doing, present tense, by his grace, and thank him for that. You can even thank him for the hardships. That's hard, 
But you can even thank, thank you, Lord, for the hardships. You're teaching me to trust you more. And then, it, I know I, I shared with Allison just this last week, I'm, I'm worried about my future. I'm at an age where I'm thinking 20 years down the road for the first time. Uh, I guess it's middle life. And uh, I find myself getting anxious. And so I shared that with her. We prayed. And So if you're anxious about the future, whether it's next year or 10 years, 20 years down the road, again, do, find that rhythm. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. God, thank you for the grace I see in my life right now. And based on the fact that I know your character never changes and that your grace is new every morning, I can rest in what you have for me for the future. It's remarkable how our salvation fuels our sanctification, remember? And how we find so much hope in those two and then our glorification in Christ. Because <clears throat> this good word from 1 Thessalonians 5 will close our time. Remember this. Because some of us right now are even saying, yeah, Pastor, I'm doubting. I'm, I'm struggling. My faith is small. That's okay. Even if it's a mustard seed, remember what Jesus said about it. Or in 1 Thessalonians 5, 23 through 24, this will not be on your screen. Just listen. Paul says this, Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. Put your name there. And may your whole spirit and soul and body, that's every part of you, be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And here's the fuel Here's that pill of grace for you for this week. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. He who calls you is faithful. And he will surely do it. Amen? Let's pray. We thank you for your word. It's good to be in a new book, in a new letter. We get to have you gently or maybe not so gently redirect our course. We need those course corrections. <clears throat> we sometimes just, you know, put the GPS on and check out. And if we're honest, we know that our love then is declining. Our faith is declining. Our, our, our thoughts of you are growing less and our worries and our fears and our sin are growing more. Forgive us when we then make a course correction by our own power and forget that you have given us a helper, the comforter, the Holy Spirit, who through your word will give us the course correction we need, will encourage us with the right word or the, the right rebuke. Thank you for the gift of being involved in each other's lives more and more, that we can find the courage and the love to say to one another, hey, brother or sister, I love you and I think this is wrong. Based on your word, would you please consider this and ask the Lord, and then if so, repent, and I'll help you walk through this. That is a loving community. Thank you, most of all, Father, for your Son. And Jesus, our big brother, thank you for how you knew coming into the flesh, coming to be born, that you would die, that you would suffer incredible torment. But you did that willingly. You gave us that gift of your suffering to pay for our sin. And then you rose from the grave because death could not hold you. For it was not your sin, it was ours. It was the sin of any man or woman or child who believes in you, who puts their faith and trust in you. So help us this day to continue to be a people who repent of our pride and our self-dependency, and to be a people who continue to humbly worship you, walk with you, loving one another, and growing in grace each day. We pray all these things in your matchless name, Jesus. Amen.